Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Crowley, and uh, I am here tonight with uh, Belmont Books. Um, my husband and I are the co-owners, and I am thrilled to be joined by authors Lance Samantha Chang and Sue Miller in conversation about Sue's about Sam's new book, The Family Chow. Um, this event, by the way, is co-sponsored by the Belmont Chinese American Association. Before we begin tonight's conversation, I want to let you know about a few events we have coming up in the next week or so. Tomorrow night, we'll be hosting the launch of The Fashion Orphans, a new novel from Randy Susan Myers and MJ Rose. The Fashion Orphans tells the story of estranged sisters brought together by the death of their mother, who has left them a very unusual inheritance. Our monthly book club will meet on Monday to discuss Yad Gyasi's novel, Transcendent Kingdom. On Thursday, we'll be hosting Kodo Nishimuro to discuss his new autobiography, This Monk Wears Heels, Be Who You Are, which is out next week. And the last event I want to mention is on Tuesday, February 15th, Tell All, Rejected by Love, which is co-sponsored by Grub Street's um, Memoir Incubator alumni. Five writers will share essays into which they poured heart and soul, but which were rejected by the New York Times Modern Love column. So it should be fun, post-Valentine's Day celebration of rejection. Bring tissues. Um, now to tonight's event. Uh, it is a thrill to have these two writers here. Lance Mantha Chang is the award-winning author of the collection Hunger and Novels, Inheritance, and All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost. A recent Berlin Prize Fellow, she has also received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. Sam is the director of the Iowa's Writers, Writers Workshop and on the faculty of the Warren Wilson Program for Writers, which is where I was lucky enough to meet and work with her. Sue Miller is the best-selling author of 11 novels, including The Good Mother, Family Pictures, While I Was Gone, and most recently, Monogamy, as well as a memoir, a short story collection, and the recipient of many awards and fellowships. Like Sam, Sue is also a teacher and has taught at a number of colleges and universities, um, including a few local college and, colleges and universities. Thank you both for being here. I read and loved The Family Chow months ago when the advanced review copy arrived on my desk. For those of you who've not had the chance yet to read it, Publishers Weekly in a starred review describes it as an ingenious and cunning reboot of Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. The harrowing and humor, this harrowing and humorous family drama is wrapped up in a murder mystery about a family of Chinese immigrants headed by patriarch Leo Chow, who builds a successful Chinese restaurant in Haven, Wisconsin with his wife, Winnie. There's so much more to say, and I am gonna turn it over to Sam and Sue so that we can get started. Thanks. Oops. Sam, I want to say this is a book. I just was um, completely taken up by it. It's just a terrific book, and um, there's just so much in it that's rich and pleasurable. Um, your sort of command of all the characters, I mean, as soon as they speak, we sort of understand who they are. Um, there's just no confusion, even though the cast is enormous. Um, and um, so that even the minor characters are just so finely drawn um, that they're just recognizable. It, there is a mystery at the heart of the book, a, a crime which drives the plot forward. And it's also very funny. Uh, it's heartrending. It's a joy to read. There's also that central controlling element to it, which is at its heart, which is that it's a retelling of the Brothers Karamazov, which is unmistakable. I thought perhaps from the comments on the back that it would be more subtle than it is. It's just right <laughs> there. Um, and so the I mean, I thought, oh, they're just sort of making that up. Um, but no, it's really just right there. And it's just high risk, it seems to me, very brave of you to do it in that way. And it comes out just brilliantly. So my first question really has to do with, with that. Um, I always imagine when I'm reading a book that's, uh, that's sort of after another book, after another piece of fiction, that there must be some very special connection. I think of um, Jean Reese with the wide Sargasso Sea, who, who writes a, a book about really the woman in the attic, Mrs. Rochester, who's, with whom she's sympathetic because she also has this past in the, uh, in, in the West Indies and um, feels 
I think just feels angry at Rochester for imprisoning this woman in his attic. So it's a completely different take on the whole thing. And I wondered what your connection was, if any, what your reason was, what the feeling you had, I mean, and did you start off knowing it would be a re, sort of a revision of that or did that sort of come to you? I'm just interested in that whole process, never having done this myself. And, and oh, no, I'd love to talk about it. it. It's so great to be talking to you, Sue, and Kathy, it was really, really wonderful of you to host um, me, and so thanks. So, no, I didn't start off knowing this was going to be an homage to the Brothers Karamazov. It, Back when I was in, in living in, in Boston area, which I think we saw each other a fair amount at that point, and I was sort of, I went through a period when I was in between projects, which as I was just saying, I'm terrible. It's a terrible time for me. So I was just casting about and reading things and writing a lot of scraps of different things. And I had a student um, who was a Russian literature major and loved this book. And so I read it and having never read it before, having attempted it sort of in a very like on serious way and failed to, to get very far. So I just discovered I loved it. I was maybe 40. You know, so it was late to be coming to this book and it really, you know, hit me It made an impression on me. Um, I loved it so much that I started, you know, casting about, which is what you do when you really like something is to find people to talk to about the book. And at that time I moved to Iowa and I, oh, I should say also that I was writing a bunch of different projects. And one of them was in the present tense voice and had this patriarchal a character and I wrote a hundred pages and then realized that the, I couldn't figure out what was happening in it. It was just horrible. Was he anything like the patriarch in? Yeah, the- it was actually some of the sentences that survived into this are the exact sentences where he enters, um, he enters the book and then later on a description of him. They're the same. I love those sentences when he, those first sentences when he, when he enters the book. Um, oh. Um, uh, I just sort of thought I, I was going to ask you to read them because um, the, the first real sentence is beyond hello or whatever he's yelling up from the basement, I think, because they just are right there and instantly you, you know who he is, you know a lot about him. Do you have that in front of you? Could sure, you read it? Sure, I, I do and I would love I, to read it. Um, it's, and we forgot that. So that would be good. So, okay, so here it is. Um, Here's so James is the point of view character right now. He's a young man. Yeah. He's, you know, just started college and he's pretty unformed and very sweet. And he's coming home over winter break to um, to the Midwest where his father and family have had this restaurant, the Fine Chow. And um, James is really hungry and he's starting to heat up some food and he's transferring, he's heating a pile of pork and noodles on the stove. He's starving. As he transfers the food into a bowl, a pounding noise comes from below. It's the sound of his father, Leo, Big Chow, coming up the stairs, footsteps that reverberate and thump with the authority of a man larger than he actually is. To these footsteps is added deep and resonant grumbling, profanity, growing more audible until when he reaches the top of the stairs, a full question detaches itself and sings into the kitchen in a ringing baritone, who the fuck is coming to clean up half an hour after clothes? So that's that was all there. Yeah. What wasn't there at that time was the restaurant. This was just a house that he was in. Huh. And I had to add like a little bit on the end of the line of dialogue to say they're in a, you know, to explain that they're in the restaurant and that yeah. he's just really, you know, obnoxiously sort of harassing his son who has just come home from school after months yeah, of it's been the warmest welcome. Yeah. <laughs> but it's um, yes. fairly fast, actually, in his, in his own way. I yeah. mean, in his profane yeah. and yeah, loud way. Yeah. 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 This is the kind of family where interruption is a sign of intimacy and yelling is also a sign of intimacy. But who yells besides him? I think that really? um, some of the well, brothers yell. Some yeah. of his sons yell. Like James doesn't yell, but I'd say the oldest Ming brother doesn't really uh, yell unless he's. I feel like Ming yells for about ten pages. <laughs> I didn't hear it as yelling, but anyway, he he declaims for about. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, 
but and Dago, is that how you say his name? Dago, Dago, Dago the name. oldest yeah. man. So yeah, he's big man. dog. Yeah, right. I don't know. I mean, I think that one of the things I wanted to do when I wrote this book was to write about a, an immigrant family that's not just silently suffering. I feel like uh, I've, I've written that. I've written about that. And I, when I was doing it in my book, Hunger, which I, I'm actually proud of that book, but I did feel that there was something missing from the families that I described in that I just couldn't figure out how to get the tone to sort of reach the point of like frustration that I often sensed in my family growing up. Like I, my dad is this larger or was, he died at 97 and a half, uh, two years ago now, but he was this larger than life, like very powerful, you know, Chinese American man. Well, Chinese, he was born in China and didn't come here until a certain age. And he was just very sure of himself and, and very much like a kind of tyrannical father figure. And um, he was a lot more morally upright than Leo Chow, but Leo Chow is way better at saving money than my father was. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, but I wanted to get a character. There. I wonder for you. <laughs> Interesting. So, want, tell me, but what was the beyond the sort of convenience and the interest you had in the oh, story? Oh yeah, Brothers Karamazov. Told you to it. I mean, oh, okay. So I became, as I said, obsessed with the Brothers Karamazov. And when yeah. I came to Iowa, I had to put away all my projects because I was too busy. But I still wanted to talk to somebody about the Brothers Karamazov, and so I came up with two ways of doing that. One was I gave a class at Warren Wilson where everybody had to discuss the book for credit. But the other thing I did when I was in Iowa City was I held a couple of these sort of not for credit, unpaid on my discussion groups. Like I didn't get any money, the students get, didn't get any credit, but I, I sort of asked them if they would read the book over Thanksgiving break and then we would just get together and talk Lord, about it. Asking a great deal. It's yeah, I know, it's a huge pages. book. Yeah. It's almost 800 pages. Well, my version, which I have right here, is a thousand. So. Oh my God! Yeah. Well, we were reading the Kavir and Volkov. This is my father's. It's just huge. Oh wow! A little what print the translation, it? Sue. Yeah. Who was the translator? It doesn't say. It says nothing in the front. That's it doesn't even say wild. the year it was published. It's a very old book. I think my father must have had it maybe in college or something. So one of the things about the Prevere and Volokonsky translation is that it, it emphasizes the verbal quality of the book. Mm. Of everybody's always talking, but there's just a voiciness to the prose itself. Mm -hmm. And that um, I also feel like it plunges the reader into the sense that time's unfolding around them because of all the voices talking. Um, there's the narrator's voice, and then there are the characters who are basically, you know, so we're just following them around for three days for the first, you know, 500 pages. Yeah. And, and so you hear everything everybody says. And I, I really loved that. I mean, basically, when I was discussing this book with so many people so many times, I internalized it or metabolized it somehow so that it became a part of my brain when I wasn't even thinking about writing. It was, you know, in my brain, and I just loved it. But you know, I wasn't writing. I mean, I wrote actually. I wrote a I wrote a short novel and published it in two thousand ten. And then I went for a few years where I was too busy to do anything. Well, I don't know. You will not remember this conversation. But back when I was, I don't know, twenty something, I had a conversation with you about having children and writing. Do you remember this? Didn't we were we went over to the law school together. Something like that. Yeah. Oh wow. I can't asked, you know, how do you do it all or something? <laughs> You said it only takes 10 years after you have a kid and then you could when it's sort of messing with your writing and then you can get back to writing again. And at the time I thought 10 years, that's forever because I was in my 20s and I just couldn't even conceive of 10 years in any way, really. And so so now I think 10 years. OK. As You've it done was, 10 years now, though. I did. them. Yeah, she's 14. Yeah. So now you should just be so productive. Well, I don't know, but I, I did notice that I that once she reached the age of reason seven, I was able to leave home and start going to residencies. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to think harder. But before I did that, I had already thought about writing this book um, because sometime in 2013, I was talking to another one of my students and he was telling me how he always liked to sort of 
I don't know, base his his work on something he's read that he really loves. At the time, mm-hmm. I think he was reading The Good Fol- Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford mm-hmm. and just thought it was an amazing book and was trying to write something in that way with this completely unreliable quality and this completely mm-hmm. sort of sinuous, you know, storytelling style. And I um, I thought, oh, wait, you know, I had this I had this narrator from years ago that was in the present tense, mm-hmm. which is something that I had always told my students not to do. And I started, it started to make sense to me that the way this book unfolds for the 500 pages, just in front of your face could be done in the present tense. Mm-hmm. And that I had this sort of tyrannical patriarch and I thought, okay, I just could do this. I could do this. It seemed like, it was like, okay, have you, do you remember, or have you read Laura Ingalls Wilder's book, The Long Winter? No, I wasn't a big fan of her when I was a kid. No, I understand. I mean, that yeah. I get why people are and are not fans of hers, but there's this whole book where it snows so much that they can't get through the snow and they tie a string to the house in from the house to the barn or tool mm-hmm. or house shed or whatever, in order to get to the cow, <laughs> to feed the cow and, and water the cow to hold on to the, you have to hold on to the rope. And mm-hmm. I feel like that was my rope. The the brothers Karamazza was my rope. But you know, because I was going through a blizzard, a horrible storm and it was basically like midlife. You know, both of my parents were getting older. I had a child, I had, you know, a job and a marriage and you know, all kinds of things and the and I had this rope that I was holding on to and it was the idea of writing an homage to the brothers Karamazza, which it's kind of like enough rope to hang yourself with because yeah yeah i mean it's just such a such an incredible tremendous work of great literature that there's something horrifying about the idea of attempting anything that would reference it and it was maybe a year or two before i was able to really do it and what what helped me was reading an essay of margo's um margo Livesey's from her book of essays about writing fiction um and it was basically about it's called the hidden machinery the book and it was basically about how um you when you're writing an homage because she had written an homage to jane Eyre, uh you just have to put the original book aside and forget about it but you didn't i mean you obviously checked in at many points no it was internalized really I had internalized it. It seems so, and it seemed to me you just did this brilliant job of every element of it is there. I mean, that's yeah. astonishing to me. It's totally not there. Um, <laughs> totally well, not there. There are so many things that I feel like I could have, I think about it. I mean, because I didn't look at that book for six years because mm-hmm. I was told not to. Um, I just started rereading it. When people ask me, what are you reading? I'm like, I'm reading the Brothers Karamazov. <laughs> um, but I haven't I, had I, enough of them. <laughs> I mean, I realized that certain things that I remembered as being a certain way actually mm. were. Um, but that's all right. I mean, that's part of, in any case, that would have been part of making your own use of it, essentially. Sure. But I mean, there were things that I could have used and I didn't. But I mm-hmm. mean, because I just put it aside and refused to, to read it for all that time while I was, you know, I... I, I had to, because if I hadn't done that, I don't think I ever, it ever would have gotten to a point where it was coherently itself. Mm. I, I mean, I can literally remember sitting in a chair and I was typing away and suddenly I thought, oh wait, I'm going off in a direction. This direction has nothing to do with the brothers Karamazov. It had to do with, you know, Dago's character or something. And then I thought, okay, I guess you, this is where you're gonna go. And then from then on the book just became its own book. Mm. So it still seems so connected to me and all of its parts is so interesting. Um, yeah, it is, something I must it say that didn't seem, I mean, not, is not so much, is the whole notion, which is so important to your book, of being an immigrant, of being from another country. Um, and that seems to me one of the very central, really interesting things uh, in your book that is, is you bring to this book, essentially, and d- didn't take from it in some way or another. Yeah, the, I mean, the thing that's in the Brothers Karamazov that's not really in here is, I mean, I think that book is basically, a, it's basically a Dostoevsky statement about Christianity. He believes that everyone, that Russia should be a Christian country. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the backbone of that book yeah. in many ways. Um, 
I have spirituality in my book. I'm a spiritual person, but I don't think I could have written what Dostoevsky did. Yeah. Um, so I have to say, my father's book, because he's a, a history of theology person, that was his life. Those are the passages that are all marked in this nice pencil oh, wow. of margins, much more than everything else. So I was going to ask you about religion in your book, but I'm interested if you would talk about um, the, the various discussions that go on. I think Ming in particular has, has the most sort of long and um, furious rant about being Chinese in America and what that means and how you're just, you're never going to be really there because you're not white. There are all these kind of rules and so forth. And, but other people talk also about it. I mean, the question of whether they're American or not it comes around at the very end too. To them. Yeah, Ming is the middle brother. And so I feel like Ming has a kind of chip on his shoulder because he wasn't the oldest. You know, there's this idea it's an old idea from Chinese culture that the oldest son is special mm -hmm. and treated specially. And I think Ming being the second son always felt like he deserved more that, you know, he, and he's kind of a know-it-all, you know, he knows what's best for everybody in the family and he just can't stop talking about it. Um, you know, how everyone's making these mistakes. If only they were, you know, smarter or better, more like him, you know, they would be, I don't know, actualized or something. Um, Ming, Ming is, I think, an unfortunate person in that he somehow suffers from self-hatred. You know, it's, it's something that happens, uh, not to everybody, but there, if you grow up in a dominant culture and you are not of that culture, you somehow can, not everybody, but you can start to see yourself the way that the other people around you see you. And, and that to some extent has happened to him. He's kind of lost confidence in his identity as, you know, a person descended of Chinese immigrants. And he just wishes that he was just a hundred percent American, which to him is white. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes on about this at length. I think uh, the other brothers do not suffer from this problem in, in the way that he does. And I feel like the journey that he has to take through the book, um, it really leads him to a pretty dark place. And I also feel, though, that by the end of the book, he's starting to come out of that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he changes, I mean, more, I think, than any other character, yeah. of course, of the yeah. book. And it's partly through some sort of revelations about um, another character in the book and, and his own assumptions. Yeah. Right. I, I actually marked a passage at the very end of, um, of Brother Karamazov because I thought, um, see if I could find it. Mitya, Dmitri says at the end when he thinks he maybe he's going to escape and he's going to run away to America. Yes, I love that. I, yeah, yeah, and he says, going to um, go to America. yeah, he says, um, how shall I too put up with a rabble out there? Though they may be better than I, every one of them, I hate that America already. And though they may be wonderful at machinery, every one of them, damn them, they are not of my soul. I love Russia, Alyosha. I shall choke there. And I thought um, that was the one place where I sort of saw in the book, in the, in the Brothers Karamazov, that real sense of what it would be like to be in another country, of another country when you feel who you are so strongly, which is not what what the sons feel, what the brothers feel so much. You no, know, the father has a strong sense of who he is. Yeah. It's the, the brothers have never been to China and so right. they don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think each of them sort of handles it in a different way. I mean, James, for example, the youngest is the, you know, the least connected to the old country. He mm -hmm. was raised not just by his parents, but by his older brothers who all loved him. And, but they didn't really speak to him in Chinese. And so he mostly doesn't have Chinese anymore. Uh, but he still looks Chinese, so that even a, a Chinese stranger would approach him and ask him for directions, yeah. um, hoping that he can speak Chinese in return. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a response to that. Not to I can't think of it right now. I love um, the idea of Dusty. One, one of the characters actually says to, to um, Ming, um, You're tourists here. You're yeah. Not, you're not, you're not Chinese. They're not You're Chinese. Tourists. Yeah, they're not Chinese. They're, they would, yeah. if they went to China, they would be tourists. Yeah, they would be white people, essentially, in a certain sense. Worse. Um, 
think it's and then you know I think at the end I think it's it's James who's sort of thinking that they they belong here now irrevocably I mean he says they've they have created their own ghosts here they're American so there's this sort of some people are ready to think of themselves as American James certainly and others are anxious about it and certainly the oldest brother has no issues with it I don't think he's not conflicted no, about it. he's more comfortable yeah I mean he's got his own problems let's just say <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I I wondered um also about um uh, <clears throat> when you sort of did you go back and look at it again before you finished your book and do any changes at all at that point that was just it. no no I just never looked at it again yeah, yeah. So were you surprised at how um how close you came to all of the elements of the crime that's in uh, both your book and uh, the brothers Karamazov which elements well the the sort of back and forth um questions of guilt and innocence and nobody really knowing uh, who's guilty and who's innocent. Um, that great mystery to all of them in a sense, which I thought was is just a wonderful part of, of, of your book. The sort of wait, the long wait to discover um, who is guilty and, and actually then the questions of who shares the guilt, who, who is part right, of it. Right, yeah. no, I think in that way it's close to the book, but as I said, I didn't write it what happened was I internalized the entire book. Like I could remember like huge, like, was, I mean, I really loved that book. And so I guess like, a lot of things in my book correspond, but I didn't actually look at it when I was writing yeah. it. Because yeah. if I had, as I said, I don't think I could have made the characters have their own struggles. Right. You know, like I couldn't have, I couldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as I said, I'm just starting to rediscover it and I'm really enjoying it. Where are you in it now? <laughs> again, again, I'm like a hundred pages into it. That's just great. I mean, I didn't actually didn't read it all having gotten your book because I have a thousand pages of it for some reason or another. Um, but um, I also wondered about um, a couple of other things um, about the, the trial about the way you chose to have the trial. There's a trial of the eldest son mm -hmm. and um, how you chose to how you chose to include that in the book, it, this sudden turn away from your own narrative. And if you want to explain it, and then I wondered what oh, that choice was about. you mean the blog? Yes, the blog, yeah. Okay, well, so- The journalism class blog. One of my favorite things about the brothers Kirmatov and something that I truly remembered from reading it, because I was interested in, in narratives at the time that were told in the first person, is that this is a first person book. Um, I don't know if your translation has it as a first person book, but the translation I read makes it super clear that it's told by a member of the community, a townsperson, somebody mm -hmm. who's just around. And so all of the sort of seemingly internal monologues or you know these intimate conversations they're all based on gossip because the only way that person could have found out about what happened in this particular hairy case of the death of you know uh Kiramatsov was uh through gossip town gossip just rumor mill and so mm -hmm. um i found that completely interesting I loved, for example, the moment in the trial when the narrator reveals themselves to be like to have been in the room at the mm -hmm. trial. And so I thought, wow, this is so interesting. I mean, I don't know. It was more like I just took this idea of a community narrator and thought about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the book has two halves. And in the first half, it's mostly the story of um, the characters in their family drama. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the struggle, the, the sons against the father, the father, you know, the father's, you know, situation and fate. Uh, and then in the second half, I flipped it so that it was the, it was more like the way people saw the family mm -hmm. that, that came out. 
because the family as an Asian American family was generally invisible to the town until they did something that was became notorious mm -hmm. for various reasons. And then all of a sudden they were seen by the community in a way that was, you know, disturbing for them because it was to a certain extent um, through the lens of, you know, racist stereotypes and tropes. Mm -hmm. And what, what I thought was, would be interesting would be to have somebody actually at the trial, but I needed to give that person a first person voice. And so because I had a character named Lynn who was struggling against her parents' wishes to become a journalism major, I made it her journalism assignment. <laughs> You know, and, and I really only got what a B on it <laughs> well, because writing a blog is actually very difficult. You oh. have to follow. I mean, she has all these rules, right? She's supposed to write short sentences. She's only supposed to write three lines per paragraph. She has to use bullet points, you know, the whole thing. And she just forgot. She gets so caught up in the trial and in her own discovery of the racism of the surrounding community that she forgets. And she just thinks I'm just going to forget this assignment and just write what I'm experiencing. And then. And then she gets the she gets a bad grade on the on the on the blog. Bad assignment. B is good. I think she gets a C on the blog assignment because they take points off every time she did something she yeah, wasn't supposed to do. Broke the rules. She gets a B for the class, but for her oh. that's like terrible. So she points out to one of the other characters she's a terrible grade grubber. Like the whole point is to get an A, and then she fails to get an A because she gets so caught up in this um, in this situation. Uh, I, yeah, no, she becomes the community voice and she also becomes the chronicler of the um, sort of outsider looking in, so the observations about the outsiders and mm -hmm. their view of the, the child family. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wondered too um, about those, you just actually referred to them, the, the, well, you talk about the way the book is divided into two and at each at the beginning of the book and then in almost exactly the middle of the book, you have these two short passages that sort of step way back yeah. and are like uh, reporting uh, in, yeah. in a way, but in the, the, your narrator's voice, essentially, not her voice. I mean, and I, I think you've just sort of explained what you were doing with that, but could you talk about the pretty subtle differences between those two? They're only a page or so each. Those two passages, the one that introduces essentially the characters, the family, and the whole book, and the one that sort of sort of revises that a little bit. I think. Yeah, I needed I needed a way of introducing the idea of the community voice, and so um, actually, um, one of my dear reader friends, writer friends, read the book and suggested that I try to like enlarge the voice so that it didn't just have chunks from the points of view of the brothers, but that it just mm -hmm. felt more like omniscient generally. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. I, I backed off in those passages from the close third. And I also sort of moved in and out of the close third in different ways. It was one of the last things I did to the mm -hmm. book was to try to make it feel more kaleidoscopic. Mm -hmm. I wrote points of view um that weren't the brothers points of view for example i wrote um catherine corcoran's point of view so, you know there are several passages mm -hmm. from that point of view um mm -hmm. it was fun actually mm -hmm. i i would i i had no idea that that omniscience was possible um and now i feel like i really understand omniscience and if a student actually asked me how to write in an omniscient third i could actually give them some suggestions it's okay. really shocking to me because again, that's something I never thought I could do, that in the present tense. But you also even, I felt as though, I mean, it's just a powerful beginning, that passage and then jumping immediately to a very closely observed scene. I mean, moment by moment scene with James. And I just thought that it was just utterly compelling and utterly inviting. I mean, to have the, the um, you know, the completely third person, very distant, and then wham, you're in this, seeing you don't really know why you're there or what's happening and you slowly it slowly becomes more and more dramatic and um you you this this man dies in front of our eyes in this very first within the first few yeah. pages and i it just seemed to struck me as such an amazing beginning for the book well thanks i mean sometimes you come back and you do write a beginning but you haven't quite got it yet when you're doing the book i think that often happens doesn't it that you yeah. return and say 
something about yeah. how should this begin kind of um i mean like in the past i had trouble with that in my first novel i just got stuck on the beginning and i couldn't change a mm -hmm. word of it and mm -hmm. i worked on it for a million years and and then i couldn't change it and i ever since i had that experience i thought i better keep like keep things more loose in my mind as i'm writing so that i can go back in and change things mm -hmm. and, and i guess in this particular mm -hmm. case i was able to do it i don't know mm -hmm. I mean, but thanks. I really, it really means a lot to me to hear you saying that you thought the beginning was working. Dazzling, yeah. Uh, you keep, how do you keep things loose in your mind? I would just like to know. Well, I'm so distracted by so many things that I've gotten this ability to compartmentalize or something, mm. to just like not, not think about certain things and then think about them. I don't know how to explain it. It's definitely something that happened to me as I've gotten like, busier and also older mm -hmm. i think being older is like vastly underrated especially for writers i think mm -hmm. i feel like there's a lot of emphasis on writers who are just starting out and that's fabulous that they need that but then also i think that some writers who go on feel like oh but what is there for me as an older writer you know to keep working it's all over <laughs> right people think that and I can understand why because there's so many so much attention paid to debuts but I think that if you stop thinking about the external attention like in inside you you learn a lot as you write books like you learn about a ton of things and then just living through life helps you learn things and then the next thing you know you find yourself doing stuff that you didn't think you could do it's really amazing I yeah I, I'm glad to hear you saying this because I'm in this sort of rut I'm in this slough of despond. I'm, yeah, anyway, it's nice to think, like well, you know, is it wait? <laughs> but see, because I see from the outside, it doesn't look to me like your work is in a rut at all. I feel like you're producing oh. like, amazingly powerful work oh. over and over, which is, a, is a something that a writer can't always do. Um, but I, I understand how- pushing for that, but I thank you no, for no, it. No, no, no. I, yeah. but I do think it, I understand how it feels to be in between things though. I hate it. Like it actually, I do, really crazy things when I'm in between projects. May I inquire? Yeah, okay. like applying to be director of the Iowa well, okay. Writers Workshop. And <laughs> from... That was probably the craziest yeah. thing you've ever done. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it was the craziest thing I ever did, but I was yeah. in between projects and I was like, what can I do? <laughs> well, I could take yeah. on this job that's like two yeah. jobs or three jobs or whatever. Yeah, yeah I'll move to the middle of, you know, Iowa. <laughs> Because, I mean, at that point, I'd grown up in the Midwest, and I sort of assumed I would oh, never return. I've forgotten that, yeah. Yeah. I did you feel a sense of returning? I did. Some? Yeah. Was it more comfortable? It's a, not, not necessarily. In some ways, yes. And in other ways, no. I was living on the East Coast for a reason. I felt more comfortable with people, like, mentally. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of just space, like, how far apart the houses are, like, how big the sky is, you know, people's just general sort of way of being. I do feel comfortable here. Mm -hmm. It's a really kind of wonderful. Well, it's a place. particular enclave, isn't it? I mean, it's such a yeah. lovely, intense um, yeah. universe, really, that that uh, has been made there, created there. It's, it's like a really, really wonderful literary version of a town the size of my hometown, which mm. was a completely different kind of little city. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted I was... to ask you about the end sure. of the book, in which um, it all seems very subjunctive to me. You know, this. Oh could... yeah. I loved that. I mean, the sense that uh, certain things are sort of pondered and thought about by each of the characters, their possible futures, and there's a kind of tilt you give towards a certain version. I think I might not be correct. But it's very open. I mean, it's very, this could happen or this could happen to me, each of them thinks. I could see it this way or, or wait, someone once told me that I could be doing that. I mean, you know, that yeah, sense yeah. of yeah. Um, possibility and nothing, nothing, nothing for sure. Nothing, no really telling us what's going to happen. Tell me about how you did it. Why? Dostoevskian, because... <laughs> When he wrote the Brothers Karamazov, he assumed it was going to be two books. He had a two book journey in mind. Um, and he finished book one and died eight months later. Mm -hmm. He just, you know, he, he wasn't well. Um, and so he left the ending quite open. 
Yes, um, he did. Yeah, Grushenka and Mitya are going to get sprung from, well, I don't want to give it away, but like they're going to go to the United States and live there. Yeah, maybe. I mean, this is it's fantasy, yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. But the other characters are plotting to spring him from where he is Yeah. and, and to free him, and he's going to go off. You know, and I... I find that fascinating. I, I'm now entertaining myself with this question. Like if, if Dostoevsky had continued the book, what would it be? Mm. One of my friends is preoccupied with the same idea. He wants, he imagines writing a book in which it would be Mitya and Grishenka in America, their story. Wow. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would be. And especially because they're going to go someplace or he yeah. thinks they're going to go someplace very far from like Iowa in that point, at that time really he thinks of a place that, where there would still be woods and, you know, that would, that, you know, um, and be very isolated and be very like Oregon like pioneers or something yeah. in, in this already developed land. Yeah, yeah completely fascinating. So yeah. yeah, I do keep, I did keep the book with that open feeling. Uh -huh. Also, I enjoyed that feeling. It had something to do with this idea that, um, after your parents die, if you're an immigrant, if, okay, let me say this. If you're the children of immigrants, if your parents are the ones who came from the old country to the, to the country you live in, and then you have never lived in the old country for any length of time, and then the parents die, your connection to that old place is gone. Mm -hmm. It's essentially gone. Mm -hmm. Nobody in living, you know, in, in your living life, in your living world, can remember what it was. Yeah. And I wanted them to go through that. It mm -hmm. seemed like that, and then they would end up in this place where they realize that a part of their lives is over, and then there's a part of their lives that has yet to be lived. And they're more in charge of that, maybe. They are, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. a beautiful book. It's really Aww. just gorgeous yeah Thanks, I've been Sue. talking to everybody about it I mean because it's just and it, it just it, I mean it's so easy to enter it's so exciting to enter just they're just all these people around you who are nuts no. but <laughs> yeah, they're nuts, yeah, they're nuts. Yeah. I mean that was that was part of the fun was was that the, they have such strong and like yeah yeah they're, they're like careening around the book yeah but it's so interesting to have someone like Ming for instance to to explain what they're really, what's re what they really are thinking, and how they don't know what they're thinking, and you know this sort of, he was he is a great invention in, in the sense that he allows a certain angle in, which may or may not be correct, but at least it opens things up for speculation. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. I think he's a little nutty. I mean, he, he actually oh, really he has sort of a nervous <laughs> breakdown. So, but. yeah, yeah. I thought that was brilliantly done too. The sort of thanks way in which his sense of his grip on reality became loose to say the least during the Thank course you. of it. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much. You know, I just realized it's quarter to I think we're supposed to, yeah. Yeah. I think there's supposed to be some questions coming in. Let's oh, see. maybe they'll have questions. Here we go. Hi Kathy. Hi. Yes, this has been great. Um I don't know, the audience seems shy about asking questions, but that's actually to, you know, for me, that's a good thing because I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit about the character of Olan, and I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly, um, because I think she's so fascinating. And um, after we, after you talk about that, I'll ask you, I have another question if, if other people don't have questions. So Olan's name, if anyone, probably people would recognize it is the name of the first wife in Pearl S. Buck's A Good Earth, who has this, yes, yeah, somebody figured it out, someone in the audience. Yes, there it is. Yeah. I didn't, certainly, but I haven't read The Good Earth. I, it's okay. a long time. The Good Earth is, you know, it's a long time ago. I, you know, that was me just having a good time. Like, one of the reasons that, that I um, wrote the book was because I, I wanted to, to work on a project that I would enjoy because my life was actually pretty rough, um, just in terms of being busy and having responsibilities. And I wanted to write something that I would enjoy. So I just gave her that name as, a, as an in, internal joke, but really because she's kind of the martyr in, in the way that in the good earth, Olan manages to make the family's fortune by mm. her relentless hard work. Uh, Olan also helps along here by her mm -hmm. relentless hard work but what did you want me to to sort of 
say about the character of Owan? I don't know. I mean, I just think her role in the family and this whole secret that's, you know, there between, you know, her and Leo um, all this time. And, you know, you know, I, I think the other thing you mentioned that amazes me, which I didn't know, is that Dostoevsky intended to write more, you know, another volume. So then I think about characters like Olan, like what happens to Olan and, you know, I don't know. I just think she was really ended interested. it with Olan, I think also, um, you know, the very, she has the last scene of the book, which is a, a very different, um, <laughs> a different take on America, really, that last scene. Yeah, somebody who read it said it feels like she's in um, Dubai or something. <laughs> but I had <laughs> always imagined she was in Las Vegas. I did. Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. Really. yeah. It was a cheesy and she... combination with the hotel. I mean, she's somebody who she's genuinely, I mean, I think one thing about her is that she's the one who calls the brothers tourists. She's really from China and she sees them as these big, dumb American boys. <laughs> and in a way, well, I can completely imagine why she sees them that way. Yeah. I mean, I can get to understand that. Um, there's a question here from Deborah Spark. Um, I have a question. If Dostoevsky was going to write another volume, he never got to it. What about Sam? Is there another half to this novel? Oh, wow. Um, I, I've been thinking about it more than I had before. <laughs> Because I, I think you could just it. fall into it, Sam. I mean, I enjoyed writing the novel, so yeah. I mean, but well, I'm not thinking about it in a, in a sort of like, active way. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I uh, I have another question. Uh, well, uh, Lisa Kishwander um, wonders if you could if you could read a little more. Um, Miss that. Um, yes, yeah, she, she said we'd love to hear Sam read a short passage. Can I ask you one question before you do that? Sure. I am curious about the food. And I wonder, like you did all that research with Dostoevsky or research or read the book and thought about it and internalized it. Did you have to learn a lot about running a restaurant? And did you pick the food because it's food you love and you know, that kind of thing? Okay, so I have never run a restaurant and it is the thing that I feel, you know, the restaurant, they feel complex about the restaurant is a setting more than it works as an actual restaurant. Like one of my writer readers told me that I need, for example, that I needed to make certain changes in order for the restaurant to actually <laughs> work. In order work. for them to have that massive party and serve X number of people, I had to cut down the number of people at the party. I had to have more servers. You know, I needed to do X, Y, and Z. But the food at the restaurant is actually. I mean, it's food that not only have I eaten like a lot of, you know, Americanized Chinese food, but also we made a lot of it when I was growing up because my parents came from China to the United States way a long time ago, back in the mid fifties, they were here. And then they moved to Wisconsin in the early sixties or mid to early, early to mid sixties. And so they came to a part of the US that had zero Chinese like supplies available. They had mm -hmm. to grow things in the garden. They had to go to Chicago, which was 200 and you know, X number of miles away and buy soy sauce and tofu. And then they would bring it home and eat it. And then in a few weeks, the tofu would be gone. And we discovered that when you put it in the freezer, it gets these tiny holes in it when it thaws out, which was fine, you know, because we wanted to eat tofu. I mean, we 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 really Americanized food without meaning to, you know, when when there isn't a very much around to stir fry, you end up stir frying the things that are stir fried in, within Americanized Chinese food. Uh, my parents stir fried iceberg lettuce. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, they. I mean, like I remember this because. They were interested in food. My mom, like a, a very good student, always trying to be really good at everything she did. And my dad, because he was this guy who remembered as a kid poking around in the kitchen, you know, where they had a cook and sometimes his mother and aunts and sisters would get together and make a ton of dumplings. And he was always poking around, you know, watching, trying to figure out how things were made. Um, 
you know, just observing. And so he would give my mom tips about it. For example, scallion pancakes. This is something that you didn't used to be able to get in a Chinese restaurant in the US because most of the restaurants had Cantonese food and scallion pancakes are from the north. But my, you know, now when you look at a recipe for scallion pancakes in one of these cookbooks, it will describe you making one pancake at a time. But my dad remembered them, you know, just uh, making like massive sheets of them and just cutting them up. <laughs> You know, I mean, so we always made two, which was, you know, something interesting. Um, there's one character in the book who has two of everything, but I sometimes feel like we make two pancakes at once because it was just, my dad just couldn't bear to just bring it down to one. It's <laughs> great. I don't know. But, but yeah, so we were always making stuff. And then my parents would try it out on their American friends. And they, they discovered that the American friends really loved certain dishes they made. And then certain dishes they made were horrific to them. And so mm -hmm. my mother made this list. And like I remember list. <laughs> me as a child. Yeah, yeah and that list is a little embellished. But my mother, <laughs> you know, big chunks of meat was definitely on the list. <laughs> What did the Americans like? What did they not like? And then my parents would have them over for dinner. It was like having a test kitchen in the house. Like if somebody said, we want, <laughs> we want sweet and sour fish, my mother would go figure out a recipe for what she imagined they would want. It was interesting. Great. I love those stories. Um, there's one more question, then maybe we could close with a reading if if you're a little bit of reading, if you're up for that. The last question is, is being uh, from Rod Kessler, is being a writing program administrator more challenging to a writer's productivity than being a faculty member? What has been the downside? I mean, okay, that's such an interesting question. I mean, both of them are hard. I think that all writers find teaching challenging in certain ways. Um, administrating is, I think, probably in some ways worse because it's hard to explain, but being an administrator, if, unless you've done it, you just can't imagine, but it's, it's just kind of a really thankless job. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about it that really affected my writing in a positive way is that I found myself when I first arrived here and ever since then, just trying to explain what we do to other people, because I think in some ways that's what program heads do. They explain what they do so that people don't cut their budget or make changes that are like just the antithesis of what you need. And um, the, 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 the thing is when you use that explanatory voice, you have to sort of gear up and be authoritative and so I found myself um, writing in the third person about, you know, the program, or sometimes in the royal we point of view, I'd be like, we feel this, you know, but, but, it, but it really changed my, I think, use of point of view, I think, like when I first started writing, everything I wrote was in the first person and sometimes very close third. And then I've had trouble moving away from the first person, even when I wrote like a really long novel, it was all it was kind of like a first omniscient. And then somehow I just kind of broke with that after I became director. If you, sorry, if you hear those sounds, it's because somebody's cleaning the building. I'm at the workshop right now. That's Kurt Vonnegut's artwork on, work on the wall back there. Wow. Kilgore Trout. Yeah. I don't see Kilgore Trout. Um, the, uh, the thing about um, that is, I think it just made me more comfortable with having authority in the voice that comes from some kind of source other than the personal experience. Mm. That's probably so, good, isn't it? I think so. I mean, I was able to write a, a, a book from the point of view of a, a white man that I, and that was my first thing. And then this one, I think being able to write an omniscient point of view to a certain extent, like in parts, um, was all because of, of um, trying to be an authority a authoritative figure or voice of something other than myself. Mm -hmm. so well, that, that that's, that's leads into this question that just popped up. How does being Chinese American affect your writing about characters in historical China? It's sort of. So that was really hard. I'd never want to do that again. I wrote a novel. I, it was while I was living in, in Cambridge that I was working on it. I mean, um that took place in 20th century china it was a historical novel and it was 
very difficult. Um, I did a ton of research. Uh, I sort of clung to a first person thread throughout the entire book. I had to have one character who could have understood and encompassed like all the decades of the events in the book. Um, it was, it was very hard. Um, it really stretched my ability. I, I showed it to my parents. Um, I knew that I'd finally done okay with the book when I showed the book to my mother, thinking she was going to check it and tell me that I had no right to be writing it. But what she really said was, how could you fall in love with that character? She couldn't even cook. Like, what was any good about her? And I thought, okay, she, she bought the, you know, she bought it somehow. She bought it. <laughs> okay. That's great. Yeah. That is great. <laughs> yeah. And it comes back to the food. Yeah, always. Yeah, we're a very food driven <laughs> family. Um, um, how would you feel about reading a, a short additional I, passage? I could read this very first part that Sue was talking about. Um, the very opening of the book. Uh, okay. Which I loved. Oh, thanks. For 35 years, everyone supported Leo Chow's restaurant introducing choosy newcomers by showing off some real Chinese food in Haven, Wisconsin, bringing children, parents, grandparents, not wanting to dine out with the Americans, not wanting to think about which fork to use. You could say the manifold tensions of life in the new country, the focus on the future, tracking incremental gains and losses were relieved by the fine chow, sitting down under the dusty red lanterns, gazing at Leo's latest calendar with the limp haired Taiwanese silks that Winnie hated so much, waiting for supper, everyone felt calm. In dark times, when you're feeling homesick or defeated, there is really nothing like a good steaming soup and dumplings made from scratch. Winnie and Big Leo Chow were serving scallion pancakes decades before you can find them outside of a home kitchen. Leo, 35 years ago, winning his first poker game against the owners of a local poultry farm, exchanged his chips for birds that Winnie transformed into the shining chestnut colored duck dishes of far off cities. Dear Winnie, rolling out her bing the homemade way, two pats of dough together with a seal of oil in between, letting them rise to a steaming bubble in the piping pan. Leo, bargaining for hard to get ingredients, Winnie subbing wax beans for yard long beans, plus home growing the garlic greens, chives and hot peppers you never used to find in Haven, their garden giving off a glorious smell. You could say the community ate its way through the Chow family's distress, not caring whether Winnie was happy, whether Big Chow was an honest man. Everyone took in the food on one side of their mouths and from the other, they extolled the parents for their son's accomplishments, heaping praise upon the three boys who grew up all bright and ambitious, who earned scholarships to good colleges, commending them for leaving the Midwest. Yet everyone was thankful when the oldest, Dago Chow, returned to Haven. Dago, coming home to his mother, moving into the apartment over the restaurant, working there six days a week. Dago, the most passionate cook in the family. Despite the trouble between Winnie and Big Chow, Everyone assumed the business would be handed down fairly, peacefully, father to son. Now, a year after the shame, the intemperate and scandalous event that began on a winter evening in Union Station, the community defends its 35-year indifference to the Chow family's troubles by saying, no one could have believed that such good food was cooked by a bad person. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> I love that passage. Well, I, I don't know if either of you want to say anything else, but I, we're at eight o'clock, so it's probably a good time to wrap up. Well, thank you for this. Thanks so much, Sam. I'm so oh. happy to have seen you again in this way. So good to see you. It it was, thank you both. This was great. And I love this book and I love the conversation. It was really wonderful. Thank you both. Oh, thank you, Kathy, not only for having me, but also for running this wonderful bookstore that I've heard so many great things about. And everybody you got to come. You got to come in person. I want to come in person. Um, well, thank you both. And thanks to the audience. And, um, you know, uh, we do have signed copies of Sam's book. Um, Sam, I, we're, I think we may hit you up for a few more um, autograph stickers if you're, I mean, um, book plates is what they're called. <laughs> book plates. <laughs> Um, because uh, people have been ordering, so. Awesome. 
great. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll, um, and um, uh, we really appreciate everyone showing up. And special thanks to Sue and Sam. Bye. Thank you. Bye.